Have you ever wondered why some wine is closed with a cork and other wine is closed with a screw top? And what exactly is cork? And where does it come from? We're going to be answering all those questions and so much more on this episode of The Average Wine Enthusiast. Hi there, my name is Mike LaPlante and I'm the Average Wine Enthusiast. So on this episode, uh, I thought I would talk about something I have been asked to talk about by a few viewers and it's concerning not wine, but it's the container and more specifically the thing that keeps the wine in the bottle. And that of course is corks for the most part. We'll talk about the other thing besides corks uh, a little later in the show. But as you can tell, I have a few corks here in front of me. And uh, we're going to go through the different kinds of corks that are employed in the bottling of wine. Um, the origins of using corks uh, can be dated back to about uh, the middle of the 17th, no, the 18th century, around 1750. And uh, a lot of folks give Mr. Dom Perignon, uh, the famous champagne uh, maker, uh, credit for being the first one to use cork in uh, a bottle. Um, of course, he was making champagne, so he put the cork in the bottle and then wired it shut. I'm not sure what kind of wire he used, but uh, that method is still employed today. So, you know, that's... Uh, 300 years of uh, very rudimentary technology that's still in use today. And I think that the fact that we still use corks to this very day to um, close a bottle of wine, I think that a lot of that has to do with um, the, the mystique that is still surrounds um, wine itself. It's one of those things that its history is really rooted in the past and something physical like a cork really reminds us of that every time that we open up a bottle of wine. Um, does it add to the snobbery of it? Maybe. Uh, the pretentiousness of it? Maybe. Uh, but there is something ceremonious about uh, pulling a cork. That's a, an expression. You pull a cork out of a bottle. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there's, there's, a, for some people it's a rigmarole for other people, they do it with their eyes closed. Um, but I honestly think there's something about pulling a cork, same with decanting. Um, you, you, you decant a bottle of wine. I also think that is something that, uh, lends to the, uh, just gives wine that extra little something or other that maybe other beverages don't have. Cork comes from a tree. Uh, is it the bark of the tree? Yes, it is. It's not the actual wood of the tree itself. It's a, a type of oak and I wish I could remember what the actual name of the tree is. I'm sure it's going to be right over here. And uh, this tree grows for about 200 years. And does it grow in your backyard? Heck no. Well, unless you live in Spain or Portugal or Italy or Morocco. Uh, it probably grows in a few other country, countries a little on a more limited basis, but it's basically right around the, uh, the Mediterranean there. And Portugal is actually responsible uh, for one-third of the world's cork production, probably being the smallest of all those countries that I just mentioned. So the cool thing about cork is it's actually the bark of this tree that lasts 200 years. Um, it takes roughly nine or ten years for a tree to regrow its bark. So there's trees sitting out there for, you know, nine, ten years before they can be harvested again, which it seems like that would be a crazy, not waste of land use, but it's obviously something that is in demand 
And these trees aren't, they, they don't grow like we grow um, Christmas trees or trees that we make paper with. You know, there's paper is a sustainable industry now that every tree that you cut down for paper is, there's another tree growing somewhere. And if you've been in certain parts of the world here in Canada, you can travel to places where you can tell that forests, forests have been planted specifically by humans to be, you know, just like corn or wheat or something like that. It's, it's planted specifically to be chopped down and used for uh, its pulp. But uh, cork trees, uh, the trees that cork comes from, um, are very unique. So cork itself is not something that's, uh, and it don't, since it only grows in very specific places, cork is an expensive way, relatively speaking, to close a bottle of wine up. And it can be more expensive because oftentimes it's got to get shipped far away. Um, countries like New Zealand and Australia, uh, at one point, uh, for whatever reason, it became prohibitively expensive. And uh, cork alternatives were, you know, proving themselves to be worthy replacements of cork. And so you'll find that a lot of wineries uh, that produce wine in New Zealand and Australia don't use cork. There's a lot of, if you go down the Australia aisle of your local LCBO or your wine store, you'll see a lot of uh, twist top uh, caps on the wine there. So yes, yeah, so cork, it can be expensive. Same with um, wines that you find out of Oregon and Washington, same story there. They get, it's got to travel a relatively lengthy, um, like right around the other side of the world to get cork to those areas. So new wineries that were coming up, you know, maybe 20 years ago, uh, they made decisions on whether they wanted to be using cork or not. Um, I know of wines that I have bought in the past that were using cork and then later vintages were using screw tops. They found that uh, whatever, you, you're saving money or you're making more money. <laughs> Depending on how you're looking at, obviously, uh, the wine industry isn't passing along savings. That's not, it's not that kind of industry where you, you do that kind of thing. You, uh, you make more money and maybe you invest in something else that makes your wine better. But other disadvantages to using cork, um, one is cork taint. Um, since it, cork is an organic material, uh, there is a bacteria or fungus or both um, that uh, gets created um, in the presence of polyphenols, which uh, obviously wine has polyphenols and something to do with chlorine as well, I believe. Uh, when those two things come together, uh, they have the possibility to create uh, this bacteria and or fungi uh, and that can get into the cork. Um, they say that it's possible that uh, cork taint is uh, a relatively common thing, but I think that it's uh, there's a lot of preventative measures in place now to decrease the eventuality of uh, getting cork taint. Uh, how do you know you got cork taint? Well, the wine, usually either one of two things. The wine will smell like um, like moldy or wet cardboard. Having said that, sometimes wine does taste like or smell like wet cardboard, but that smell goes away and then the wine ends up being fantastic. Um, or there is a lack of any aromas or taste at all. It just, it's all been, it's, it's gone to a point where it hasn't smelled bad, but all the natural good smells and tastes are uh, rendered, uh, you know, not useless, but just rendered gone, invisible. Um, so that is a way that you can tell if you have a bottle of wine that is suffering from a uh, cork taint. Another not good thing about cork is you can get cork uh, since it cork is a uh, it, it's compressible I think that's the right word I want to use so it, you can com it gets compressed when it gets shoved into the bottle and uh, so it's 
it's elastic and there's some elasticity to it and um, if you're keeping a wine for any uh, length of time you're going to want to lay it down and the reason for that is because you want the cork to remain wet so that it retains that elasticity so you have that constant pressure of the cork pushing up against the inside of the neck of the bottle. Otherwise, um, your cork will dry out. This drying out of your cork will result in the cork getting smaller, like most things that dry out. And it may only get smaller by you know, a couple microns or something, but just that little bit of uh, extra oxygen getting into the wine um, will make the wine go bad, turn into vinegar usually. Um, you know, that usually just happens because of bad storage. So when you get a, a dry cork, usually you put the cork screw and sometimes you'll actually feel the whole cork turn in the neck of the bottle and then usually it comes out without even having to, you know, fulcrum it out. You can just pull it out with your hand with the cork screw in it. Um, and then if you look at the bottom of the cork, uh, which should normally have some sort of, you know, hue on it, pink or purple or, you know, whatever, a darker color than the actual cork itself. Usually there's like nothing on it. It looks like the other side of the cork if it's dry corked. And uh, your wine is usually, you know, good for French fries. Is this very common? No but it's something that uh, is unique to cork. Let's, let's just put it that way. Um, so what about cork? Uh, is all cork created equal? No, cork is like any other thing that's uh, grown uh, and it's graded. You know, you can get uh, crappy oranges or you can get really good oranges. You can get crappy apples and really good apples. Uh, beef is the same way, you know, so it gets graded. Um, based on uh, a, a criteria that I know nothing about. If you're a winemaker and you know that your wine is really good, you're gonna get a cork that is of the highest quality because you wanna make sure that your cork uh, can hold up th through the test of time. And you don't want your cork to be the thing that wrecks a really good bottle of wine. But if you're a winemaker, uh, which is the majority of wine make that is made uh, that uh, has wine that's, you know, has a shelf life, let's say, of three to five years, which, you know, a, a good majority of red wine anyway, um, that is the shelf life is three to five years. So your cork only has to last, you know, five years. So you buy a cork that has uh, that kind of quality built into it. So it's been tested to make sure that it lasts that long. Simple as that. Uh, now, if you're, you know, if you're making a wine that's um, only, you don't expect it to get drank after three years, well, then you can use maybe a synthetic cork or a cork of lesser quality or a, a cork that's uh, made of a composite. I have some corks here in front of me that I've just saved up uh, for the cork show. Um, so this first one that I have here is from a bottle uh, of Italian Barolo. It was delicious. And uh, you can tell that it's got like a, a tan color to it. Um, so it's darker. Um, it's one of the darker corks out there, but it's a, uh, obviously since it's a Barolo, which is a uh, pretty high quality wine out of uh, Italy, uh, they you probably used a very high quality cork in it. Um, next to that, I have a, a couple of uh, corks from bottles of wine that came from France. Now these are a little lighter, so I, I suspect, that, and, and I don't even know if that they grow any cork in France. Uh, I never, I did some research and no one ever mentions cork trees grown in France. So these are obviously sourced from somewhere else, whereas these are probably grown, this cork is probably grown right in Italy, whereas this might be Moroccan cork for all I know. So it's a little lighter, uh, but you can tell it's, uh, there's a certain, certain look to it that you can tell it's of a good quality. This one here is uh, some Bordeaux. It seems to be a bigger cork, but it's same thing. It looks like it's got uh, some good quality cork um, characteristics to it. Next to this is a, another 
um, cork from a bottle of French wine. But this one is made of reconstituted cork. So what they do is they take cork product, maybe the stuff that is no, not as good, or you know, just it's like the scraps of cork, and they chop that up and then they glue it back together. It reminds me very much of a uh, particle board that you buy at, uh, at the lumber yard. Uh, you know, it has that, that look to it, so that it's all reconstituted and glued together, held together somehow. And uh, you see a lot of these. And uh, do these last long or longer than actual cork? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, does it let as much oxygen into the bottle as regular, uh, like non-reconstituted cork? I'm not sure either, because that's part of the aging process of a, a bottle of wine. So if you have a bottle of wine that you know you want to age, you know, for a specific period of time and it will get better as it ages, some air has to get into that bottle. Like we're talking minuscule amounts of air, but still air has to get in there for this wine to age properly. And that's another reason why cork is, is good for that purpose alone. But if you let it in too much air, obviously not good at all. So does this let in? Is this a good cork for aging? I am not sure. Uh, Rioja, I got a Rioja, Rioja cork here. This too is a uh, reconstituted cork and I would suspect it's made from cork product grown in Spain. Um, then there is this kind of reconstituted um, cork. This seems to be bigger particles of cork that are put back together as opposed to this seems like more of a, a finer um, particle that is glued back together. So this one here is, um, yeah, like I say, and it seems lighter too, like the, the actual weight of it is not the same. More air inside this cork for sure. Now here's some cork uh, that was shipped to Canada. Uh, out to BC. Uh, this these seems like very good cork as well. It might be Moroccan, not positive. And here's another one that was shipped to a, a winery here, my favorite winery, uh, Musedri. Um, and uh, those are shipped to Canada. And I thought these are both really good wines. So they obviously want to make sure they buy good corks. These are both easily sellerable wines. Uh, some corks that have been shipped to California. This is uh, some J. Lore, which I'm sure uh, a lot of you out there have drank in some J. Lore out there in uh, wine drinking land. Also some uh, Mondavi uh, as well, sh cork that has been shipped to California. This also seems lighter as well. Mondavi has the whole, I'm sure they buy different quality cork for different wines that they make for sure because there's just such a huge a winery. And then there's this one here. It's not uh, a fake cork or um, synthetic, which I, I, for some reason, I don't have one of those. I'm not sure if synthetic corks are only put in wine that I would never buy, but, uh, but this reminds me of a um, synthetic cork just by the, the way it looks. It's smooth, but it's, it's the actual cork company is right on the cork, which is unusual a little bit. Um, it's called Classic Green, 100% recyclable material. So this looks like it's super fine material. And is it all cork? Who knows? You know, who knows what's in here? But uh, this was also found in a bottle of wine that I bought uh, in the last year, at least anyway. So what about screw top closures for wine? What's, what's the disadvantage of using them? There really is no disadvantage, actually. Um, if there is a disadvantage, it would be that wine will not age the same way. If you have a wine that you know, you know has over 10 years to uh, age, you probably won't put a screw top on that bottle of wine. Because like I said earlier, you want some oxygen to be able to get into the wine. Some, when I say some, I mean very little, but that very little bit of oxygen helps that wine to age in such a way that as um, things start um, breaking down in the wine, 
uh, and the tannins uh, start doing their job and holding the you know the body of the wine up it requires some oxygen to go into that so that is the only thing that I could see that is bad with screw tops but as far as having a wine hold its freshness or you know doing every bit of a good of job as cork cork screws are not cork screws but screw tops are just fine and dandy like I said uh, wineries in uh, New Zealand and Australia and Washington and Oregon they all use screw tops and a lot of rosé bottles as well they use screw tops usually what you'll find is the less expensive bottles of wines will use screw tops having said that there are some yummy wines out there that I have had that use screw tops and it's funny how that uh, you can get into this mindset that anything that has a screw top on it isn't as good as something else that you've drank that's not the case at all there is <laughs> many of a bottle of many bottles of wine that I've drank that aren't as good as some wines that I have drank with screw tops on them don't not buy a bottle of wine because it has a screw top on it and uh, enjoy pulling some corks that's all I can say I'd like to thank all of you for watching this show and if you have friends who are into wine as much as you are please turn them on to it and if you have any comments leave them down below and make sure that you're subscribed it's free just hit the button subscribe bam you make me so happy you know what else makes me happy is the big organ trio because they let me use their music on every episode of my show well i guess that's going to do it for this episode thanks again for watching everybody until next time my name is Mike LaPlante and I'm the Average Wine Enthusiast. Salute!